What's going on, everybody? Welcome, welcome, welcome. So today there was an article that went up on mtgo.com about the Vintage Cube that comes out tomorrow, August 16th. And in the article, Ryan Spain, who's one of the MTGO designers, uh, he worked at Wizards of the Coast for a long time, and now he's working exclusively, I believe, on Magic Online. Uh, he put out an article, and it goes over the fact that this might be the largest change to the Vintage Cube in the history of the Vintage Cube. I believe there are 80 cards that were changed, and we're going to go over them. We're going to go over them today. And I haven't gone over any of them yet. <clears throat> I've, I've maybe read three or four of the changes, but the majority of these I have not read or, or checked out yet, so... It wasn't a train station in Florida the first time Kerwin and I met. It went, and we went to Disney after that. That was the first time we met, really? That's weird. It feels like earlier than that. Huh. Anyway, the first card that was removed, Arena Rector, replaced by Sun Titan. So, this is interesting to me. Arena Rector is also in my cube because I think the interaction of being able to get rid of your own Arena Rector, either by sacrificing it or removing it or blocking... To get like a big fat scary planeswalker like an Ugin or a Nicol Bolas or something is really, really cool. I really like that interaction. That's a two that's basically a two-card combo, or a, it's almost like a one-card combo, because all you need is arena rector and then to naturally play out the game in order to make it happen. That being said, I I, I can appreciate that it's not for every vintage cube, and also Sun Titan is just a staple, so I'm actually surprised that it was removed to begin with. Um, and the comment is the rector deserves some appearances in the cube, but we'll wait until the big planeswalker theme is better supported for now. We'll complete the cycle of M11 Titans. Again, sun Titan is hardly a windmill slam. That's rude, but it does powerful things in the right deck and is familiar to players, which is a good thing to add back in when making this many changes with so many new cards. I agree in the sense that I don't think sun Titan should have been removed. And I think it just goes in so many different white decks. It goes like in a, the white blue control deck it goes in aggro white decks. Like, you can pretty much put a Sun Titan in any in any deck, and it's fine. So, next card was Alesh Norn. Mother of Machines was removed, which is the five mana Alesh Norn, and replaced with Guardian Scale Lord. Uh, the Mother of Machines proved too specific and too slow to, to cement herself as a regular starter. I agree with that, unless you have a ton of enters the battlefield abilities that you want to capitalize on unless like that's a specific theme in the cube. I, do, I just don't think this is very good. And this is the why, this is the reason why I also didn't add her to my own cube because I just, I, I don't think she's very good without that. Um, she was fine for an iteration that leaned into a, to blink a bit. Guardian scale Lord on the other hand is a real evasive powerhouse, whether as a curve topper or as a solid value engine for your mid range pile, this might become your new favorite dragon. And I think guardian scale Lord is good. I think the problem is it overlaps with Sun Titan for me a bit too much. Like they're both four to five, they're both five to six mana creatures. They both get a, get a non-land permanent back with a very specific value once you attack. I mean, I don't know, like this, this is a great card. Don't get me wrong. I think it's better than a Leshnorn, but like going like turn five scale Lord into turn six Sun Titan, it's just very, very much, there's a lot of redundancy there. And I think for me personally, in a cube with only 540 cards, like I try to limit that kind of redundancy because I th think you only have so many slots and you want to have a lot of variation. So I don't know. I, I think the card is good. I don't think it's a bad switch. I think it's definitely better than a Leshnorn, but I also think these two are very similar. So Guardian of Girapur was removed. Weathered Wayfarer was brought in. Guardian was fine for leaning into Blink a bit, but only targeting your own creatures instead of any non-land permanent made it no Flicker Wisp. Additionally, it doesn't have Flash, right? So you either want to target all permanents so you can like Blink out a blocker, or you can get rid of an opponent's token, or you want to have Flash so that you can save a creature or Blink's, you know, have an instant speed blocker. Like Resto fulfills one category, Flicker Wisp fulfills the other, and Guardian of Girapur is kind of like it's in the middle of the Venn diagram, but it's not as good as either one. And that's just, I think it's just worse. Guardian was fine. It's no flicker wisp. We'll swap it for a flexible one drop doing something other than aggro, which plays nicely with fetch lands and strip mine wasteland. I like weathered wayfarer as a card. So I think it's funny. I did, I did see that the bribery was taken out of the cube because it facilitates unfun play patterns. And I kind of agree with that, but I kind of don't as well. The problem is you're going to bring in Weathered Wayfarer, which actually helps 
strip mine slash wasteland strategies, which are mainly there to recur strip mines and wasteland and prevent you from actually playing lands. And I think that's even more, le that's even less fun for me, me personally. Um, I'll explain this a little more when we get to, um, get to bribery. I, I think this is a fine swap. However, I think the justification is poor. If you're, if you're looking at fun play patterns, loyal retainers taken out, which is a card I didn't even realize was in the cube and karmic guides brought in loyal retainers is interesting, but too clunky and narrow relative to other creature cheaters. So we'll show all the birthing pod fans some love and put karmic guide birthing karmic guide is fantastic. It's I think it's in, I think it's in my cube. It's just a five mana good card. The thing about loyal retainers is that it has that super weird portal stipulation um, that says Sagarius Lord Trainers return a legendary creature card from your graveyard to the battlefield, activate only during your turn before attackers are declared. So it has this like really narrow time frame that you can return it. So it just doesn't make any sense. I mean, it makes sense, right? It makes sense. That's like Portal Three Kingdoms. All the Portal sets had very weird stipulations to try to to try to simplify gameplay. So that's why you can only do loyal retainers at that moment. But the problem is. It's kind of narrow, especially for the cube. It's a three mana one, one. You can ret only return legendary creatures from your graveyard. Like at this point, I'd rather just have a four mana reanimate spell, you know, I don't know. So yeah, I agree with this. I think Karma Kind's better. Mana Tithe is out, Reprieve is in, while White Remand, a, sta a new staple emerges. Mana Tithe could come back in a spot where we want to push white counter magic, but this is a perfect swap for maintaining a touch of it. I... See, again, I agree Reprieve should be in, but I also kind of like Mana Tithe. So then again, Mana Tithe promotes a lot of feel bads. Um, so I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of ambivalent on this. Um, I think Reprieve should be in. I think it's a great, fantastic, I think it's a great tool for white decks. I do like Mana Tithe, but I think this is a fine swap. A plus. Ravages of War. Okay, this is interesting. My personal cube has Armageddon and that's it. Part of it is the price point of Ravages of War, because let's look up Ravages. $350, okay. And I would want to get the non-foil, so I don't want to foil in my in my cube, so it would be $350. Bucks. Yeah, that's, that's, that's prohibitive. And Savine's Reclamation is brought in. So I do have Savine's Reclamation in my cube. Um, I think it's unique enough from Sun Titan, even though it pretty much does Sun Titan to be in the cube and the flashback's really, really cool. For those who don't know, Savine's Reclamation is... Uh, return target permanent card with mana value three or less from your graveyard to the battlefield. If you flash this back, you can return two. So you get to copy it. So you get two, three drops. Or, you know, two drops or, you know, whatever. It's mana value three or less, so cool. So again, like this, I have this and Sun Titan in my cube because I think they're both very good. I, it's funny because now they have this Sun Titan and Guardian Scale Lord, and that's a lot. That's a lot of like reanimating effects for like three cards. It's been a long time since draft both Armageddon's and build around them was a winning vintage cube strategy. We'll keep Armageddon around for now as a good sideboard option for specific matchups, but having two is suggesting a deck is there that isn't. Savine's Light Reclamation is a flexible value engine, which even works on lands. I can't really complain about this because I do have Savine's and I don't have Ravages in my own cube. I think it's good. But again, it's like you're taking out the oppressive land destruction strategy, but then for Weathered Wayfarer, you're promoting Strip Mine Wasteland, which is just kind of rough. Because no one's like getting one wasteland to kill a man land or a creature land. Like, that's just not what's happening. Like, you're going to get it so that you can play your Crucible of Worlds and then just keep killing their land every turn. Seal from Existence is replaced by Leyline Binding. Is Seal from Existence... Is that just... Okay, this one's actually very good. Three mana, when Seal of Existence enters the battlefield, exile an island permanent. It's basically an Oblivion Ring, but it has Ward 3 and it costs an extra white. So I actually like this card a lot replaced by Leyline binding, which is essentially, let's be honest, not a white card. This is a three to four color deck, three to five, three to five color deck card. Seal of Exist seal from existence is a very fine version of this effect, but double white is a real cost. I agree with that. Leyline binding is a constructed powerhouse that should be in this cube as long as triumphs are. Yeah. So if you're playing like a white deck and you have one triumph, it's going to reduce the cost by two more pips. So it's going to make it three. 
I guess that's fine. I the, my, the, my issue so far with these swaps is that they're not one-to-one -one swaps. You're taking out a mono white or a two color deck oblivion ring effect and you're bringing in a three plus color deck effect. Like if I'm playing blue white, I will 100% play, play seal. If I'm playing blue white, I likely won't play ley line because it's going to be five mana or four mana. Like, I don't know. I mean, again, like, I'm not saying this isn't a good card. I'm just saying these two are not similar. Like, you're not replacing similar effects. Temporary Lockdown, which is, like, exile all creatures that cost two or less or that have power two or less. I'm going to look these up because sometimes I don't know the exact wording. Uh, each non permanent mana value two or less until this leaves the battlefield. Great. While it's a solid effect in the abstract, it proved too difficult to generate a big advantage from it. Touch the Spirit Realm. I agree with that. Touch the Spirit Realm is a little more restrictive than your classic O-Ring effect, but the option to channel at instant speed gives it that extra spice. I agree. I think Touch the Spirit Realm is a great card. For those who don't know, that's a lot more than I expected. It's a three mana Oblivion Ring effect. When it enters the battlefield, exile up to one target artifact or creature, so you can't hit everything. And then you can discard it to exile an artifact or creature, return to the battlefield under its next under its owner's control at the beginning of the next end step. So you do get a blink effect as well. So it's cool. Um, yeah, again, like these aren't doing the same thing though, right? Like this is a one of this is a kind of board wipey card. I still agree with this. I don't think I think temporary lockdown is really really narrow. I think it's a kind of it's like a worse almost pyroclasm. It does hit non-creature permanents that cost two or less, but there's not a ton of those that you really care about. If it was three or less, I could see it, because then you're hitting things like Seal from Existence or Touch the Spirit Realm, but it's not. Tishar Ancestor's Apostle. Is this the combo? Yeah, this is the this is like the, the combo bird, where it's like whenever you cast a Historic Spell, return a creature card with mana value three or less from your river to the battlefield. For Sarah Paragon. Um, I like Sarah Paragon a lot. It's very resto, uh, three, four, four, four. Once during each of your turns, you may play a land from your graveyard or cast a permanent spell with mana value three or less from your graveyard. If you do, it gains when this permanent is put into a graveyard, excel it and you gain two life. So <laughs> there's a real problem here that I'm seeing right this second. It might not be a problem and maybe it's an archetype. But so far we have Sarah Paragon, Savine's Reclamation, Sun Titan, and Guardian Scalord. We have four separate cards that are all returning things from the graveyard. And maybe that's deliberate. But like there's a lot of redundancy between these four cards. They're all doing very, very similar things. This says an experiment, which turns out to require a little more support. While we might have to char back in the future, we will go with more reliable recursive flyer for this run. And then we have White Plume Adventurer coming out, which is interesting because that's a controversial card. White Plume Adventurer gives you the initiative, which is an extremely controversial mechanic. Uh, and that's being replaced by Steel Seraph, which is the six mana or three mana prototype. So you can either play it for three as a three, three flying first strike, lifelink, vigilant creature. Or you can play it as a 5-4 for 6. At the beginning of combat on your turn, target creature you control gains your choice of flying, vigilance, or lifelink until the end of the turn. So usually you would give it itself lifelink. So then you have a 3-3 three, three flying lifelinker or a 5-4 flying lifelinker. Or you can give it vigilance. Or you can give something else vigilance. I mean, still serves pretty sweet. It's for the most part a white card. Right, it's not really a white card, but it does fall into the white card category. White Plume Adventurer was unfun good. <laughs> it's very much like Palace Jailer, I feel sometimes. Still working out with the right amount of such cards as the Vintage Cube, but for WPA, we don't intend to bring it back without other initiative creatures. And in a no-holds-barred content... Yeah, if this is your only initiative creature, then it guarantees you're the only player that's going to be able to, like, have the initiative. And I mean, they could attack you, but the point is you're the only one initiating the initiative. Would you prefer an unfun good card or two properly supported in each iteration? Or would you... Oh, oh, no, hold on. Would you prefer an unfun good card or two properly supported in each iteration? Or would you prefer an occasional pure power iteration 
that doesn't cut powerful cards for their play patterns. In the meantime, Steel Seraph returns to fill the white three drop roll while doubling as a big artifact for decks that care. This is interesting because they say it's <laughs> it's filling the white three drop roll, but it's kind of not because you can't get it back with Sarah Paragon. You can't get it back with Savine's Reclamation and you can't get it back with Sun Titan. So while this is a, a white creature you can cast for three, you're not going to be able to get it back with any of the creatures you're putting in here for the strategy of it. So hopefully that, that slot is well filled out. But I don't know. It's weird to say like that fills the three drop slot because it's not doing the same things you want from a three drop in this cube. Hullbreaker Horror is replacing Agent of Treachery. I think I have Hullbreaker Horror in my queue. I don't have Agent of Treachery. The Agent was in, was in for the lean into Blink, but Hullbreaker Horror can go infinite with multiple pieces of fast mana. And is he more reliable game ending threat? Welcome back, Breaker. Um, I think this is fine. The first time I really liked Hullbreaker Horror in the cube was when someone had a Gilded Drake and they played it and they... Oh, let me see how this interaction works. I forgot. Uh, return a spell you don't control to its owner's hand. Yeah, so you would basically get their creature, give them your Gilded Drake, then when you cast the spell to return your own Gilded Drake to your hand, and then you can just keep looping that. So that's kind of cool. Ancestral Vision is removed. Ooh, that's interesting. I don't know how I feel about that. It's kind of a staple. It's really cool with certain cards. Hard Evidence is a card I just don't care about. Blue is receiving a lot of updates in hopes of improving its chances to compete a little better on the battlefield. Hard Evidence is a flexible piece that provides a decent defensive body, puts a card into your graveyard, provides an artifact, and replaces itself down the line. While this doesn't look exciting on first glance, correct. Vintage Cube isn't only about playing the most powerful cards. It kind of is. Um... You also need a cohesive deck. Yes, that's true, but, you know, the powerful cards do a lot of heavy lifting. This is where role players like Hard Evidence absolutely come in clutch. But, I mean, you could say the same about Ancestral Vision, I think. Like, a turn one or two Ancestral Vision is very good. There are times where you're going to draw it on turn five or six and it doesn't feel as good. So, maybe it's fine. I don't know. Ancestral Vision I love is a card. But, I'm willing to give Hard Evidence a shot here. Blue isn't about doing stuff on the battlefield. I think their point is that you want blue to compete on the battlefield so they don't just lose on the battlefield. So the blue deck actually can have a chance to do this stuff. Yeah, Arcane Proxy was literally the card I thought of when I thought of Ancestral Vision. So taking that guy out when you take out Ancestral Vision makes a lot of sense. Merktide Regent. Arcane Proxy didn't hit the mark, so then the Regent would like to come back in and show the Proxy out of aim. Interesting. I don't have enough experience with Merktide Region other, other than knowing it's really, really good. I don't know. I'll have to see. It's definitely a build around you card. Like, it's not a card you can just splash in any deck. You just really have to play the instant or sorcery deck. Brain Geyser, which I didn't know why was in there to begin with. Adding Blue Sun Zenith instead. We're removing Pally, which is probably Palancron. But there are still a couple of infinite mana combos to be found, so we'll try this self-recurring instant speed version, which might be a little more appealing to control decks as well. Um, the problem is I don't foresee anyone playing Blue Sun Zenith. It's triple blue, for one. It's a sorcery. Is it a sorcery? Actually, it might be an instant. It is an instant. Okay, but it's triple blue. Yeah, that's... I mean, sure, like... So I also have um, a way to um, explosion is what I'm looking for. I'm sorry. I'm trying to look up cards and also communicate. This is my method of if you have infinite mana or enough mana to blow them up. I mean, I just think Expansion Explosion is a better card. I think it, it's more versatile. It does basically the same thing. You can make them draw, or you can just deal them infinite damage. Um, it costs one more colored mana, but if your goal is to go infinite with it, I th think you're going to be able to do that just fine with Expansion Explosion. So, I don't know. That's the card I kind of like for this role. I don't think Blue Sun Zenith is attractive enough on its own to do that. Whereas Expansion Explosion is like, okay, I'm playing a mono blue deck. 
I can still use this first half to good effect for two mana. So it's very versatile. Bribery is out, Flash is in. This is a, this is a change I don't approve of. So Bribery belongs in Vintage Cube on power level, but its fun is abysmal. I disagree. <laughs> Too often, it effectively ends the game on the spot, either because it finds an Eldrazi or it finds nothing amazing and the caster can't come back from a five-mana do-nothing spell. Neither result is fun for either player. Flash, on the other hand, is a great addition to the creature cheat strategies and deserves a shot, especially after we cut show and tell the last time around and several of the underperforming green creature cheaters this time. Oh, geez. I have a lot, I have a lot of thoughts on this. One, one of the things I talk about in the Vintage Cube is that I would rather the game end on the spot when it's a foregone conclusion than have to draw it out for five, six extra turns. Like if you have a recurring strip mine, the game is over, but it's not going to end. So like, you're going to keep destroying my land every single turn. I can play my turn. You're going to destroy my land. I can play my turn and it's going to keep going on like that. I'm not dead, but I'm essentially dead. With bribery, at least the game ends. You either know they get a, like, and then there's there's also counterplay, right? Like they get a, like, so they get an Eldrazi. Cool. I know you're going to kill me with this Eldrazi, or maybe I have an answer. I can bounce it to my own hand. There's so much counterplay with bribery. You can board out your big fat creatures. <laughs> you know, it's funny because I feel like I've played bribery a ton. I love it as a card to play. I don't like having it played against me. But I, I feel like I can do things against it. I'm like, let me board out my big creatures. Let me bring in some bounce spells in case they get my creature. There's a lot you can do against a bribery. Meanwhile, Flash being a creature cheat doesn't make any sense because you still have to pay the mana or else it gets sacrificed. Like me and Elk Tears were actually talking about this earlier and you, <laughs> you don't get a chance to respond to anything. So if you put a Gristlebrand into play with a flash. You don't get a chance to activate Gristlebrand. It just goes to the graveyard because you didn't pay the extra mana that, that it costs. So unless you're paying like six mana for a primeval Titan, two for the flash and then four for the primeval Titan, you're only going to get two lands out of it, which is not bad, but it's still a two for two, right? Like you're still, you're getting rid of a flash and a primeval Titan and you're getting two lands out of it. Like, it's not great. I don't know. Like there's not that. Yeah. It just gives the creature flash, right? Flash costs two, but makes it too cheaper. So it just gives it flash. It's not cheating anything into play. Like show and tells a cheat. Bribery is a cheat. Cause you're paying five mana for a 10 mana creature. You're playing three mana for a seven mana creature. You're getting a discount. Flash isn't cheating anything into play. It's just giving you, I mean, you might as well play quicken, right? So it just doesn't make any sense. Like it's not like you're searching your library for it either, right? It's got to be in your hand. I'm not crazy, right? Put a creature from your hand onto the battlefield. Sacrifice it unless you pay its mana cost reduced by up to two. Yeah, ETBs. That's what I'm saying, though. Like, So for Primeval Titan, you waste Flash, and your Primeval Titan dies, and you get two lands. I mean, how like that's a two for two, right? You wasted two cards to get two, two lands into play. How often is that better than like a rampant growth or a far seek? I mean, there's going to be some enter the battlefield effects that you want to use, but it's not a creature cheat. It's not cheating any creatures into play. It's cheating ETB effects into play, but not creatures. The creature is not going to be there. So I don't know. I mean, like, and also like a lot of the, <laughs> it's funny because a lot of the Eldrazi, like Emrakul, like it'd be cool if you can go flash Emrakul and get a time walk turn but these are not cast, right? No, you're putting it onto the battlefield. You're not casting it. So like, it doesn't even work with a lot of the big fat idiots that you would cheat into play. You can get creatures in your graveyard. Yeah, I guess so. I mean, that just doesn't excite me though. Like, I don't know. Chain of Vapor being replaced by Snap. Chain of Vapor provides some funny shenanigans disguised as a bounce spell, but we can do better on that front. Even... Even without mana doublers, the free nature of Snap makes it a great tempo play, and of course, does some cool tricks for combo decks. Honestly, oh wait, I went way too far. <laughs> I'm trying to keep these at the bottom so we don't go too far. Um, yeah, neither of those really excite me. I'll be honest; I didn't care about Chain of Vapor being in the queue. I don't care about Snap being in the cube. Um, <laughs> Kermit, the one thing I asked Matt was like, "Well, did they put Protean Hulk in?" And they did not. So, 
okay, Consecrated Sphinx comes out. Uh, Torrential Gear Hulk comes in. Thank you guys so much for watching. I'm going to end it here and probably not going to be participating in this this vintage cube iteration. So uh, hope you guys had a hope you guys enjoyed this analysis so far. Have a great night. I'll see you next time. I just can't. I am dead inside. So another long-standing staple that used to be well worth the six mana now presents too much of a blowout. I disagree if it's answered before you can draw. Yeah, but that's the... Oh. <laughs> it presents too much of a blowout if it's answered before you can draw. But like that rewards players who set up situations where it doesn't get killed. Like, let me let me have hand discard. Let me keep up free counter spells. You set up situations where you don't, where you can avoid those blowouts. Meanwhile, like I want the really powerful effect. Like that's literally just risk versus reward, right? Like you get the powerful effect, but the problem if you if you if you mess up, if you don't get it, it's a blowout. Right? Like that's the risk. If it's answered before you can draw, we're even leaning into draw push draw punishing a bit. Your draw punishing in vintage cube. But this draw punisher punishes the caster too often. Instead, we're getting another old friend in the conspire with in the in to conspire with dream halls and casting magma opus. The artifact type matters too. I love magma opus and I love torrential gear hook with magma opus. Both of those are in my vintage cube, but there's no way I be, would cut consecrated sphinx for that. Like, like consecrated sphinx is the the feeling you get when you slam a consecrated sphinx. You task the turn and they go to their draw step and you draw two. Like, yeah, dude. Oh yeah, I feel punished. I mean, I don't think I'm punished. Like, that's the thing though. If they kill your Sphinx before you draw, you played a creature and they killed your creature. Like, that's magic. I don't know. It doesn't seem like, it's not like, it's not like in order to play Consecrated Sphinx, you have to pay 10 life. Pay 10 life and then you get to play Consecrated Sphinx. Like, it, it's just a creature and you play it and you get good shit if it lives and if, if it doesn't, if it doesn't live, you don't get the, the things. I don't know. <sighs> that's frustrating. Like it's frustrating. I also don't. I don't necessarily agree with the analysis. Glenelinger Arc Archmage for subtlety. The final pitch elemental makes it, and at last, the Archmage is iconic, but feels a step slow these days. So we'll give her a rest for now. I have to assume subtlety's inclusion is based on how powerful it seemed at the Modern Pro Tour recently. Um, I love Glenelinger Archmage, but I think it's fine to take out. I think Glenelander Archmage is a, is a card similar to Consecrated Sphinx, only cheaper, where once you play it, like, your opponent feels very, very demoralized. They basically have to throw away two non-creature spells. Um, it, it, or else they're, you're just never going to resolve anything. So you have to, like, throw cards away in order to actually get your, your third non-creature spell resolved. I, I think it's good. I don't think it's overpowered. But I think Subtlety is also very good. And I think pitching two cards, subtlety and one other card for the alternate cast is totally fine. We'll see. This one makes me die a little inside as well. Okay. Muldrifter out. Chrome host seed shark. And everyone loves Muldrifter, but creatures have become a bit more powerful since Lorwyn. They're not more powerful than Muldrifter. Chrome host seed shark comes with a good defensive body for controlling strategies that pay off for non non creature spells matter and the ability to make artifacts to abuse with Urza Lord high artificer Tolarian Academy and many others. I agree with all of that, but when I'm on three mana and I can't find a fourth mana, a fourth land, mull drifter is going to help me do that. Chrome host seed shark is not going to help me do that. Did Frank offend this guy personally? No, actually I love Ryan. I think he's great, but I think this should be in the cube and I think this should be in the cube. I would easily take out flash or snap to keep mull drifter in. I don't think either one of these are, are doing anything. Palancron was a card I've never cared about. I've never comboed with a Palancron. I accept that it can do that. It's fine. Frost Titan is also a card. I just don't care about. I think like, it's funny. Cause we're like, um, Creatures have come up, become a bit more powerful since Lorwyn, but then we're bringing Frost Titan back, which is just not a super powerful card. I love Palancron in the abstract, but as it's stated in the article, Vintage Cube is not a card museum. 
It's a play experience. The infinite dream is Palacron offers are better lived through the other infinite combos in the cube. Maybe Frost Titan doesn't make it if we weren't competing. Complete. Com I think they mean completing. Maybe Frost Titan doesn't make it in if we weren't completing the Titan cycle, but in a world where board presence matters a lot, Frosty may surprise you. So interesting. You guys like the Frost Titan. I, I'm fine with taking Palacron out. I don't care about Frost Titan at all, though. Um, yeah, I, and I agree with this. I agree with this philosophy. I don't think so. Elktir's actually mentioned to me um, that one of the things he does is kind of look at his vintage cube as like a a magic museum. Um, it's a card museum, right? Like where he's kind of chronicling the history of magic within his vintage cube. And I try not to do that. I'm looking at Warhammer 40k cards. I'm looking at Lord of the Rings cards. I'm looking at, you know, secret layers and, and alternate arts and borderless cards. And I'm putting all those in there because I love the way they look and they're all magic to me. And I just want cool effects and cool cards and, and cool experiences. I just don't think Frost Titan is like providing this cool play experience, you know? He's fine. It's a fine card. But it doesn't get me excited. I'm not like, yes, Frost Titan. I feel like I could probably come up with three better blue man, blue six draw. Like, I would rather have Consecrated Sphinx instead of Frost Titan. So, I also don't think Titan should be all or none. Um, I don't think there's any real reason for that. I mean, that's like saying... I mean, I think that's true with lands. Because then you're, then you're allowing all of the colors to be equally represented and easily played. But there's definitely cycles where I don't feel like they're all equally uh, positioned. Riftwing Cloudskate comes out. Okay, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Stop it. Get some help. And Otawara Soaring City comes in. Riftwing Cloudskate is another card that has become a little slow in this modern era of pushed cards. I don't think so. Odawara is a clunky bounce, but having that effect on a land is huge. I agree, but I don't think you can take out a blue spell for a blue land. That's just my opinion. Oh, man, that's brutal, dude. I don't know. Losing Muldrifter, Riftwing, Cloudscape, Consecrated Sphinx, and Glenelindra Archmage are all very, very painful. Thassa's Oracle coming out. Totally fine with this. Uh, Fairy Mastermind coming in. The Oracle is an extremely powerful combo piece, but we will bring it back when it is better supported. Fairy Mastermind almost came in last time, and with Orcish Bowmasters and Shieldred, a Punish Opposing Draws theme is emerging in Demir. So it definitely makes it in this time, and I suspect it will become a staple. That's fine. I think this is a totally fine... I think this is a totally fine replacement. I actually don't love Thassa's Oracle, and I think it promotes like a lot of one-sided play where people are like, here's my Thassa's Oracle. I'm going to go through my whole deck. Oh, I won the game. Cool. You didn't get to do anything. That was too bad. Sorry about that. Thassa's Oracle. What are you going to do? Bye. And that's not very fun. It's the same reason I don't love Storm as an archetype because it just, it's really one-sided. <laughs> um, so like, that's why like my cube actually doesn't have a dedicated Storm deck. Like it doesn't have like, the, the cheap one mana spells that you're going to play 40 of in one turn while your opponent just sits there like this, waiting for you to storm off. That doesn't exist in my cube because I don't think that's a fun play experience, which is similar to bribery, right? But like at least bribery. And this is my, this is my defense of bribery over storm with storm. Your opponent sits there for, for 10 minutes and tries to combo off while you just sit there and watch them with bribery. Let me search your deck. You got an Emrakul? Cool, Emrakul. Can you answer it? No? Game's over. Let's go to the next one. And then we get to keep playing Magic together. <laughs> That's why I'm okay with Bribery, but I'm not okay with Storm. Storm is a one-sided play experience that you don't know if you've lost for 10 minutes. Bribery is pretty, pretty one-sided as well, but you at least know you've either lost or you can deal with it. And then you get to move on. So that's my, that's my philosophy there. Blood Artist, which... Didn't really feel great to begin with. I feel like it was very lowly, lowly supported, very minimally supported. I don't know how I feel about Orcish Bowmasters coming in. They're great. They're probably good. They're probably too good. That's my concern, that they're too good. We're saying goodbye to the pushed sacrifice theme for now and welcome a future mainstay. Punish opponent draws is an emerging sub-theme for Demir that has a lot of play in Vintage Cube. Okay. I mean, it's fine. This is just a staple. Like, I feel like it's probably going to be an... Every vintage cube that exists because it's just that good. Bloodgast. 
a card I do not care about, for Tenacious Underdog. Upgrading to a better recursive two drop. Black, black, and unable to block is a pretty big ask. Agreed. And while it's great with Skull Clamp, we have plenty of other black cards to fill that role while doing things for other archetypes. Underdog overperforms in both the aggressive and defensive departments. I think this is fine. Tenacious Underdog is a great card. I mean, I don't know if Glint Sleeve, Glint Sleeve Siphoner is still in the in the queue, but I would probably play Glint Sleeve over either of these because I think it's really strong. And it's just, it feels good to have a 2-1 Menace that can draw you a card every other turn. Braid's Cabal Minion, another card I did not love. Uh, for Rankle Master Pranks, which is another card I don't care about at all. We brought Braids back last iteration for the Sacrifice theme, but she will not stay. While she offers a unique angle that some players will miss drafting, Rankle will be a worthy replacement until we can call Braids out of retirement every now and then. A lot of people love Rankle. I don't, I personally don't like symmetrical effects. I don't like both players discard a card. I don't like both players sacrifice a creature. Like they're really difficult to engineer where you come out ahead. They do happen, but they're kind of difficult to engineer. Like it's very hard to be like, well, I got a shitty creature, so I'm going to sacrifice that. And you kind of have to, otherwise you're sacrificing Wrangle. So honestly, I don't really care about either of these cards. I, I, I'm not going to be playing Rankle a ton. Like, it's just not a card I pick highly. Cabal Therapy out. Probably should have been out. I'm not a big fan of Cabal Therapy as a removal spell in a limited format. In Constructed, it's great because you can name a card, see their hand, sacrifice a creature, and then rip maybe two or three of a, of a certain card out of their hand. Where this is often going to be a two for one uh, for your opponent. An 0-4 Defender isn't half bad in a mid rangey to controlling deck, but this also turns into a bolt-proof beater that disrupts your opponent's game plan. The Vendillion Click-esque effect also supports the draw punishers, like Orcish Bowmasters. Let's, I'm going to look up the exact text of Concealing Curtain. So it's an 0-4 with Defender for 1 mana. That's good. And then you can transform it as a sorcery for 3 and then it becomes a 3-4 menace. When this creature transforms, target opponent reveals their hand. You may choose a non-land card from it. If you do, that player discards it, then draws. They get to draw a card. It's 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 very much like a... It, this is just a poor man's thought not seer. <laughs> right? Like, it's a 3-4 it's a instead of a 4-4. Four, four. Uh, when it comes into play, you get to look at their hand and take a card. Only they get to draw the card immediately. So, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I think this card is good, though. Don't get me wrong. Um, I think an 0-4 is, is great to have on board. I think it's definitely better than Cabal Therapy. I don't know if it's Vintage Cube good, though. That's my problem, I think. Because when you play the Vintage Cube, you are trying to have these really powerful, iconic magic experiences. Gorio's Vengeance replacing... Replaced... Hmm, we'll get this right being replaced by Corpse Dance. We gave it a shot, but the cheaper cost of Gorio's Vengeance gets outweighed in the end by Corpse Dance's flexibility, both in terms of its targets and the ability to buy it back. I dislike including Graveyard Order Matters mechanics. I do too, and I wouldn't put Corpse Dance in because of this, but it's where some of the vintage reanimation power lies. I disagree. I think you can easily use Diabolic Servitude. You could use, uh, I don't know if Makeshift Mannequin is in here. There's plenty of reanimation effects that are just fine I mean Corpus Dance is 3 I get that but putting the top creature from your graveyard I imagine Shallow Grave is also in here which also hits the top card of your deck of your of your graveyard so like you just have so many cards that are dependent on the top card and that's me just assuming that the Shallow Grave is still in here because I would put Shallow Grave over Corpus Dance because it's a 2 mana that's what Gorgia's Vengeance replaced I believe I think it replaced Shallow Grave so the fact that you're not putting Shallow Grave in over Corpse Dance is just worse to me. I believe this is my rebuttal article. <laughs> Heroes Downfall into Baleful Mastery. This is fine. I also have Baleful Mastery in my cube. I think it's great. Um, another Exile Removal, which also works nicely with the newly added Fairy Mastermind and Orcish Will Masters. Yeah, because this actually lets them draw a card. And then you get to put a counter on your Fairy Mastermind and draw a card and make a 1-1 one, one and deal a damage with Bow Master. So that's pretty good. Ah, uh, yeah, that seems fine. 
I mean, Hero's Downfall, in, in this in this economy, Hero's Downfall is just overpriced for a, a card that deals with a Planeswalker and a creature, especially at double black. Makeshift Mannequin is being replaced, so it was in here, by Life and Death. See, that's, uh, that's interesting to me, man. I don't know. Mannequin has never been a great performer, and now more than ever, mana requirements matter. Even with the ability to theoretically get back in Eldrazi, four mana is prohibitively expensive for vintage. I disagree. What does Life and Death do? Okay, all lands you control become 1-1 one, one creatures. They're still lands. Return a creature card from your graveyard to the battlefield. You lose life equal to its converted mana cost. That actually seems pretty good. I'm actually surprised I didn't consider this sooner. This is just a two-mana reanimate, right? Yeah, this is a great change. This is, I like makeshift mannequin being an instant. There is definitely times where you discard an Emrakul at the end of the turn and makeshift mannequin it to like an Undas Prowler or something. Like that's a legitimate combo. But I think life and death is the versatility, having two different color options here, having two different modes. I think that's that goes a long way. I would probably play life death over um corpse dance to be quite honest with you i would rather have life death and makeshift mannequin than corpse dance and life death but mesmeric fiend into kite sail freebooter the ability to sacrifice the fiend in response to the trigger's q but since most of the sacrifice theme is making its departure we'll go with a more resilient evasive option i think this is fine a one two flyer versus a one one non-flyer it's true like the the ability rarely comes up one of the things you could do with Mesmeric Fiend is you can't kill it while its ability is on the stack or you never get your card back. With Kite Sail Freebooter, if you have one piece of removal in hand, they play their Freebooter, trigger goes on the stack, you can kill it. And then they look at your hand and then they take nothing. With Mesmeric Fiend, trigger goes on the stack. If you kill it, it dies. It's returned to your hand, trigger goes on the stack. That resolves, returning nothing, and then it's take a card from your hand, trigger goes on this, resolves, takes a card from your hand. So Mesmeric Feed is actually much more resilient in terms of removal. If your opponent has one piece of removal, they get to kill Kite Sail Freebooter, but they don't get to kill Mesmeric Fiend. So I don't disagree with this, but I do think there are significant differences, and Mesmeric Fiend was definitely harder to deal with. So Midnight Reaper getting replaced with Gix, Yawgmoth, Praetor. This seems fine. I, none of these, neither of these are going to blow me away. They're just three mana, three, three, three slash three twos. With a reduction in sacrifice synergies, we are back to getting rewarded for attacking your opponent rather than creatures dying. Gix also comes with an activated ability that most opponents have to be very careful of. Yeah, the Gix activated ability, while very expensive, is very sweet. Uh, there's a lot of Gix cards. <laughs> I've made a terrible mistake. So for seven mana, you discard X cards. I've done this. I've had like three or four cards in my hand. XL the top X cards of an opponent's library. You may play lands and cast spells without paying their mana costs. It's a strong effect. Plus, like whenever a creature does combat damage to one of your opponents, its controller may pay a life. So if you attack with three creatures, you can potentially draw three cards and pay three life. Like that's, it's not like whenever creatures you control deal damage, you may activate this effect once. It triggers for each creature. That deals the damage, so. I don't personally care about Midnight Reaper. I think Gix is a cool card with a cool vintage cube. Like, when I think of a vintage cube effect, this seven mana effect is vintage cube for me. Like, that's a cool effect. So, I, I, will, I will agree with that. Phyrexian Tower comes out. Urborg comes in. I don't care about either of these, to be honest. I've never had a deck where I'm like, man, I could really use an Urborg slash I could really use a Phyrexian Tower. The Tower was a bit of a miss, even in Sacrifice, so we're welcoming back Urborg, which improves Bizarre of Baghdad and the Dark Depths Vampire Hex Mage combo. I do agree with that. If you have Vampire Hex Mage and Dark Depths, Urborg is a winner. That does seem better. I have my doubts that... Um, oh, I don't like this one at all. I have my doubts that... Uh, Obliterator is in this cube because I don't think they have I think Obliterator is at his best in a cube when there's a devotion strategy because I think it's actually surprisingly good even in like a vintage cube but 
I don't think they have that. Ravenous Chupacabra coming out. Noxious Geralt coming in. I do not like this. The best part about Chupacabra was was its cost. It was four mana to kill a creature. Like six mana. Uh, it's just too much, man. Ravenous Chupacabra feels overcosted and outclassed, but you're replacing it with a six drop. While the Gearhawk offers a bigger body, gains some life, and is an artifact for some welder shenanigans. I just, I don't know. If I'm weldering Noxious Gearhulk, I already feel like I'm not doing what I want to be doing. Yeah, I, I think I think the Chupacabra is just better at having the black deck survive in the mid game. Like, I want to be playing bigger, cooler creatures at six and seven mana in black decks. I, I don't agree with this one, unfortunately. Rotting Regisaur into Misery's Shadow. The dinosaur is beefy, but hard to optimize even in Reanimator. We're giving Black an upgraded version of an Antuco Shade, allowing it to be more competitive in the aggro mid-range department. But then you took out Ravenous Chupacombra. I don't know. Um, I rarely played Regisaur, but I appreciated how good it was. Like, it was a card that, like, it was a 7-6. It needed to be answered. Sometimes you're discarding, like, a big fat creature and then reanimating it on turn four because you have makeshift mannequin. You know what I mean? So like a lot of the play patterns, a lot of the, the things that a vintage cube could do, you need to reevaluate those things now. Cause you're like, Oh, I can't draw makeshift mannequin. Oh, I don't have rotting register to discard my, my reanimating creatures. So interesting. Interesting. I, I mean, this could be fine. I think misery shadow is a great card. Shriek Maw into soul transfer. Okay. So we're just getting rid of all the creatures that cost less than six mana that kill other creatures. I think soul transfer is actually trash. I tried soul transfer in my own deck or my old cube and it, it did nothing. The fact that it was just significantly too difficult to get both choose one exile, a creature, or planeswalker. That's fine. But hero's downfall is going to be better. It's also a sorcery return a creature or planeswalker from your graveyard to your hand. Like you're never going to play three mana raise dead in the vintage cube and having an artifact and an enchantment was just way too difficult. It was, it was, it never happened. And I was always really discouraged that this was a sorcery. This is a worse version of everything you want to do. It, this is a card where the sum of its parts, how does the saying go? The sum of its parts are greater than the whole. This is a, this is a card where the sum of its parts are worth significantly less than the whole of the card. Is that right? I don't even know if that's correct. This is a real fool me, fool me once, you won't get fooled again situation where I just can't think of the, the wording. Unlike Chupacabra, Shriek Maw is a little more versatile with Evoke, but the target restriction can be brutal and exile removal has become increasingly important for containing powerful value engines. Yes, but I think there's a much better options than this. Meat Hook Massacre replacing Massacre Worm. No, don't like that. With Sacrifice gone and the static being less relevant, it's not less relevant. It kills everything. The Meat Hook Massacre now feels a little clunky. Wait, oh! Oh, this is, I read this backwards. Guys, Massacre Worm is back. Massacre Worm is back. Oh, thank God. Oh, okay, good. Pretty, 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 pretty. Pretty good. Okay, Meat Hook Massacre is out. Massacre is back in. I approve of this change. <laughs> Dear, thank God. Oh, oh God, I'm just okay. We're doing, we're doing good. We got it. Woe Strider out. Evolve Sleeper in. These are both fine. Woe Sleeper. Uh, Woe Strider is a three mana card that you're never like really excited about including. Um, Evolve Sleeper is a one mana dude that kind of has a figure of destiny vibe going for it. It's kind of cool. I think it's good. Without much payoff for sacrificing, Woe Strider is a bit homeless. That's insulting. So as we did in white, we're smoothing out the curve a little, giving black back a potent one drop. I think that's totally fine. Woe Strider always overperforms for you? Wow, that seems wild. Avalanche Riders out. Rampaging Raptor in. I like Rampaging Raptor a lot. It's also in my cube. It's basically, let's call it a red questing beast. 4-4 four, four with Trample and Haste. Okay, so it doesn't have all the abilities. But you can pump it for 3 mana, so you can deal 6, you can deal 8. Whenever it deals combat damage to an opponent, it deals that much damage to target Planeswalker that player controls, or a battle that player protects. So, 
I mean, this card just seems really good. It's just a 4-4 hasty dinosaur idiot with trample. And you get to also deal damage to planeswalkers. And I think this is a super cool card. Um, I think it's a I think it's a great four drop for a red deck, and I also think it has questing beast vibes, which is pretty cool. Avalanche Riders died of old age a while ago. We've just been carrying around its corpse. Let's bury the rider and add a four drop with haste that red decks can really use. I agree. I agree. Plus, it always feels like I get it, you want to kill the land, and that's cool, but like it always felt bad when you play an avalanche rider, you kill their land, and then you're like. Well, I guess I got to put this guy in the graveyard now. See you later. Because you're never paying the echo cost on Avalanche Rider. You're never doing that. Blood Feather Phoenix is out. Dragon's Rage Channeler is in. Blood Feather Phoenix didn't work out. Let's channel our rage over to that one drop we cut last time. I, I don't... I'm not excited about either of these cards. So I have... No real dog in this fight. I mean, Dragon Rage Channeler seems good if you're including, like, Murktide, because you're obviously going to lean into that archetype. If Demolish did two damage to a player, you wouldn't play it, and that's basically what Ryder had come... Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. Has become. I'm using voice-to-text. Chandra, Chandra Acolyte of Flame, which was never great, I'll be honest. This is not a Planeswalker I was excited about. Into Nahiri's Warcrafting. I honestly don't think Nahiri's Warcrafting is that good, but... Three mana... It deals five damage target creature, planeswalker, or battle. Look at the top X cards of your library where X is the excess damage dealt this way. You may exile one of those, put the rest on the bottom. You may play the exile card this turn. The problem is it costs three mana. It's a sorcery. It doesn't say until the end of your next turn. It has a lot of the things that you don't want this to have, right? In a red deck, let's say I have five mana. So I have to like, I have to kill a creature with low toughness. Like, the, the bigger the creature, the worse this gets. I, it's five damage for three mana. That's the best you're looking for, right? Like, you want to be able to kill something for five. for With five toughness. If you kill something with two toughness, you're already wasting a good removal spell on it. And then you can look at the top three cards. And play one this turn. But how much mana do you have to... Yeah, like you're like it does feel like the most you want to do is hit a land. Like you want this to be a three mana hit a land card. But it's also like it feels like it's so random because like if I if I kill a four toughness creature, I get to look at one card. If I kill a three toughness, I get to look at two cards. So you have to like balance how much mana do I have left over versus how many cards I get to look at. And I want to maximize my chances of being able to play that card. It's just kind of confusing. I mean, I guess it's like if you're just looking at it like this is a five damage spell for three mana that has like a cool upside, that's cool. That being the case, I'd rather it have flat, uh, not flash, but in, it'd rather be an instant. And also, I'd almost rather it just be char. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I'll take two damage from char because it's A, it's easier to cast. It's one red. It's an instant, and I can deal damage to their face. Like, all of those are very, very important for red decks. Instant, dealing damage to the face and being easier to cast. Like, I would rather this just be Char. And, yeah, I don't know. We also have not seen any battles, yeah. And we're also already on red. Um, Shauna is fine, but was really in because of sacrifice support. And here he's Warcrafting, fulfill some important roles for red, running card advantage, and the ability to get rid of problematic creatures with high toughness, such as Shieldred. I don't think this is going to provide the card advantage that you think it does. And that's the problem. Like, this is a removal spell with disguised card advantage that looks like card advantage, but it's not really card advantage. Like if you use it inefficiently, if you use it to not kill a creature or like to not, not to not kill a creature, but to not kill a good creature, then it's probably maybe card advantage. I don't the great rebel is out. Kumano faces Kakazan. <laughs> That is interesting. Eidolon is a hard to cast 2-2. Not in a mono red deck, though. And that's the only deck you're playing it in. No deck that is not mono red is ever going to cast an Eidolon. With downside in some matches, another vener venerable card with better options in modern magic. Kumano faces Kaza Kakazan, Kakazan Kakarat is another exciting one draw for Red Mage's spreading three power and a ping for one mana with the right sequencing. I do think Kumano is great. I do think the one mana saga is really, really good. 
I don't agree with the 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 their justification for removing Eidolon. It's never hard to cast in a in the decks you're playing it in. Like that's the point though, right? Like it's hard to cast because the ability is very niche and it's very, very powerful for the decks that can cast it. It's it's hard to cast because it's requiring you to play it in a mono red deck or a heavy, heavy red deck. So like you're, I mean, like that's not a downside. That's just a feature of the card. That's just how the card works. Like you should be playing this in heavy red decks or mono red decks. And the card is telling you that. So it's weird to look at that as like a downside, you know? It's like, well, we, we cut Emrakul because it was really hard to cast at 15 man. I, well, yes, but it's supposed to be hard to cast. Like it's a 15, 15. Embercleave is out. I agree with that. Goldspan Dragon's in. This seems fine. Uh, Cleave is certainly powerful, but it doesn't fit well in every aggressive deck. I agree with that. Like, if you're an aggressive deck with two or three creatures, it's going to be really hard to, like, put a Cleave into play. Or uh, Much less every red deck. We are bringing back the Dragon for it, which fills a similar role as a Curve Topper while being broad more broadly applicable. I think Goldspan Dragon is a fantastic, really, really powerful card, but it's not an overpowered or oppressive card. You can kill it easily. It doesn't, like, take over the board. It's just one dragon, and it gives you a bunch of treasures, and that's fine. And Embercleave is kind of a dick. Goblin Bombardment out. Bitter Reunion in. Bitter Reunion. I'm okay with it. It's a modern staple. With creature tokens tossed onto card effects like candy these days, some sacrifice outlets don't need a sacrifice theme to be justifiable. To be a justifiable inclusion. However, Bitter Reunion is an interesting option we want to try with Reanimator often turning to red for discard outlets. Um, It's not only just turning to red, but Bitter Reunion giving haste is really, really strong. Because you can actually reanimate something and then just give it haste with Bitter Reunion. Sacrifice of creatures you control gain haste. Um, This is like head and shoulders better than like a lot of of the red cards that are like discard a card, draw two cards. Like this just does it better because you can give the creatures haste if you want. Uh, yep. All right. So agreed with that. Greater Gargadon out Itali in hundred percent, thousand percent. Love it. Gargadon is a fun card, but makes it exit makes its exit along with some other sacrifice theme cards. Yeah, you get so many free slots if you just take out this weird sacrifice uh, theme. Itali is a powerful threat to reanimate or sting into play, but hard casting it is reasonable as well. I agree with that. I love Itali. I think Itali Primal Conqueror is one of the coolest cards in was it March of the Machine or was it? I think I think um, All Will Be One and March of the Machine came out so close together that I literally can't tell them apart. So, either way, Atali, super cool card. Really, really approve of this change. Past in Flames out, Mizzix Mastery in. That's fine. I think Past in Flames was a card that, like, it, it seemed good for the Storm decks, but it's not that good. I don't know. I think it's really narrow. Like, in order for it to get, like, in order to use it correctly, the stars really have to align. As a weak Yawgmoss will analog, Past in Flames has felt like necessary evil to give Storm some cast your graveyard redundancy. That's kind of what I said, yeah. With Underworld Breach giving... Oh, we have Underworld Breach, I guess. Giving us a strong alternative analog, we can let Past in Flames go up... We can let Past go up in Flames. Past should be capitalized there because it's you're referring to the card Past in Flames. And instead, give you a spell that allows you to recast your graveyard all at once. Try yours with Dream Halls today. Oh, dear. Mizzix Mastery is actually a very cool card. I am a big fan of it with Cruel Ultimatum. So if we don't have Cruel Ultimatum in the cube, going to be very disappointed. Because the whole point of Mizzix Mastery is to cast like really, really hard to cast 7, 8, 9, 10 mana sorceries that are in your graveyard, right? Exile a target card that's an instant or sorcery from your graveyard. For each card exiled this way, copy it, and you may cast the copy. Yeah, like, I just want to be like, turn two, discard Cruel Ultimatum. Turn four, Mizzix Mastery Cruel Ultimatum. You know, that's all I want. Magma Opus, same thing. Yeah, I agree with that. So, Perforos is an intervention, a, a card I have no attachment to whatsoever, uh, for Mizzix Mastery. 
or no, for Mind Collapse, sorry. Mind Collapse can get rid of Shouldered and alternate no mana casting costs are right at home in the Vintage Cube. A free spell for your storm turn or removal for that blocker in the way of a hasty beater you tapped out to cast. Intervention was only ever here for a quick visit when there was more to do with a bunch of temporary tokens. Yeah, I actually think Mind Collapse is fine. If it's your turn, you can sacrifice a mountain and it deals five damage to a creature or planeswalker. And then you can just cast it for four, but again, that's really expensive in the vintage cube. But five damage is a lot. So like, this is a five damage card I think is fine. Whereas like Nahiri's Warcrafting, I'm like, well, you're always paying three for this at sorcery speed and it's two red. So it's like Eidolon is, is, is hard to cast at two red, but Nahiri's Warcrafting is easy at two red and one more. So... Don't agree with the Eidolon call. I don't even like Eidolon. I think Eidolon is trash and I hate it, but I still, I appreciate its 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 place in the Vintage Cube. Red Elemental, red Elemental Blast is out, which probably should, I don't think they should have been there to begin with because only red and blue have these, these type of effects. And if we're doing that, we might as well put like Dystopia and Gloom and all these other really, really strong hosers in the cube. Rabbit Battery is in. Dedicated sideboard cards are always shaky, especially against blue, which hasn't even been the big bad in Vintage Cube of late. Rabbit batter Battery has the potential to be a premier one drop in that it also boosts your later plays. Sticks around for the rebuild after a wrath effect and enables some hasty reanimated monsters. Let's look up Rabbit Battery. Yeah, okay, so I mean, it's basically just a 1-1 one, one for 1, but then it's also an equipment that you can equip to give a 1-1 one, one in haste for 1. I think this is actually totally fine. I personally don't care about Red Elemental Blast, and if you're going to give another really solid 1-drop, I think that's that's okay. Rekindled Phoenix is out. Pia and Kieran Alar are in. I think both of these are subpar 4-drops. Um, I think I've taken both of them out of my own Vintage Cube. I'm going to check right now because I have my own vintage cube. My own vintage cube, my, my four drops are Caves of Chaos Adventurer. So I do have an in, in, uh, initiative card at Sushi the Blazing Sky, Flame Tongue Kavu, Goblin Settler, which I think is better than Avalanche Riders because you get to keep the creature and you can sack it to other things or you can block. Hell Rider, Rampaging Raptor, Torbran, and Urabrask. Those are my four drops. So I don't have either of these. I think they're both a little meh. Rekindling Phoenix wasn't really bad, just mixing things up a little while getting in another way to sacrifice the one ring. Oh, I guess we have the one ring in here. Should the temptation come over you? Young Pyromancer is out. Scrapwork Mutt is in. That's interesting. Similarly, the third path iconoclast and Sahili representing superior token splitter spitters. But those are not those are both white red. <laughs> And which, which Sahili? The three mana Sahili? Because I don't think the three mana Sahili is actually very good at all. We are benching on Pyromancer for a scrappy hound that offers support for some different archetypes such as Reanimator. Um, I guess that's fine. I'm never super excited about Young Pyromancer, to be honest. But again, I don't think this justification is good because you're not going to play Third Path Icon Iconoclast in the same deck as Young Pyromancer all the time. Like, you, these are... This is a, a mono-red card. This is a red-blue card. They're not the same. Court of Bounty out, great. Exploration in, not great. Court of Bounty lost its case on speed and reliability grounds. Exploration is narrow and not as explosively powerful as Big Brother Fast Bond. But extra land drop each turn is a powerful line of rules text that can be built around with reasonable success, especially with several other lands, uh, land cards, lands, land, <laughs> with several other lands cards coming in to replace the clunky side. And there's a, there's, there's a double space here. Please hire me as your editor. I'm looking for work. Coming in to replace the clunky side of Green's creature cheating. It still generates a decent advantage relatively quickly and also goes well with the reintroduction of Field of the Dead. Um, I assume this means you took Fast Bond out, which is weird. I don't love Fast Bond, but again, it feels like a Vintage Cube card where I'm like, this is one of those powerful effects in Magic's history. I get to play um, all my lands in one turn, which is great with like Upheaval or if I play like Gush. Exploration doesn't really... Fast Bond is just a better exploration, but it's not broken enough to not 
to, to be to be subbed out. Does this make sense? Whereas Court of Bounty, I think, is not great. Um, I think a lot of the courts are either too powerful or not powerful enough. There's very few like average courts. Oh, Eureka's out. That's too bad. I actually love Eureka. I think it's super fun. Invasion of Ikoria in is Invasion of Ikoria just finale of Yeah, it's just it's just finale of devastation for the most part. Uh, in addition to being a trap card in terms of results, disagree. Um, I think anyone who's played with Eureka knows it's not a trap card. Eureka gets the same rap as Show and Tell, but the effects are completely different because you can build your whole deck around it. And if you play an Emrakul and they play an Oblivion Ring, they get your Emrakul, sure. But you're also playing an Ugin and a Primeval Titan and a Crater Hoof Behemoth. Like, you're playing more than that. And the odds of them having one answer is great, but the odds of them having an answer for each of the things you've built your deck around is is very unlikely. <laughs> so I just I think I think it's like uh, yeah, that frustrates me. Eureka's currently bugged. So that's another reason, I guess. We're going to pull it anyway. There are so many other more reliable dreams to live for four mana. Like for example, invasion of Ikoria with Vampire Hex Mage lurking somewhere in your deck. It's not I don't know, that's not really a dream though. Like like that means that means you're playing green green black black and like <laughs> It's very, it's like your mana base is so strained, right? You're playing green, green, black, black, dark depths and thespian stage, colorless, colorless. So like, it's, I don't know. I actually don't really, I'm not super concerned with the other sides of the um, invasions because I feel like they're not super common to flip. 8-8 eight, eight with reach. For each non-human creature you control, you may have that creature assign its combat damage as though it weren't blocked. So thorn of, thorn elemental. Yeah, green, green, black, black is easy, but in red, red is in, but RR and mono red is so hard. Yeah, it's, there's a lot of conflicting theories I feel like here. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, Invasion of Ikoria is good. I also have it in my cube, but I took out Finale for it because they're basically the same card, but Invasion of Ikoria is a little bit more fun to play. The odds of you getting to 10 plus mana for finale seems low and it's, it has been low in my experience versus playing evasion of Ikoria. And then you have the potential to flip it and make an eight, eight. Like that seems like it's a cooler interaction. Heartbeat of spring is out. Call of the ring is in. So we're playing, we're taking our green card and adding a black card. Heartbeat of spring's fine. Like no one cares about heartbeat of spring or mana clash or not mana clash. What's the other, what's the one mana flare? With the departure of Palancron, Heartbeat doesn't have a lean to slash home anymore. Meanwhile, Call of the Ring is an absolute beating, providing invasion, looting, attack, death touch, and eventually face bolting. What more could you ask for? To not have to learn tempt for one card is a fair response. Is tempt? Oh, the ring tempts you. I guess we're calling it tempt. Sure. Is a fair response given the lesson of White Plume Adventurer, but hear us out. It doesn't need other temp cards to function, and the temptation path is always there when the card is. So it's like having to learn a wordy planeswalker. If there's a time to see it belongs, to see if it belongs, it's when most active players are familiar with the temp mechanic. Yeah, that makes sense. I can get behind that. Like now is probably the best time to introduce um the I guess we're calling it the temp mechanic. I think Call of the Ring is really strong. I think this replaces a card like Phyrexian Arena. They have very similar abilities. They're both letting you draw cards for life. They cost two to three mana. They're both enchantments. Um, I don't... Yeah, I, I feel like... The, I think if anything, that the thing that bugs me a lot is that the cards aren't really correlated. Like, this is not replacing Heartbeat of Spring. It's just a card they added, and Heartbeat of Spring is a card they took out. I mean, maybe that's... Maybe that they don't see it that way, but that's kind of how it feels. Uh, pattern of rebirth coming out. I disagree with that. I like pattern of rebirth a lot and it's in my cube because it's just, this, this is a cool cheat effect. I would take out flash and put pattern of rebirth in because it literally like, they just can't, the, the creature can't leave the battlefield or else you get to find a bigger one for Elvenwald oddity. Another dud bites the dust replaced with a four drop that beats down hard and fast before transforming into a game ending mini hoof. Um, I guess. I don't know. I mean, I don't know. 
This guy's just, I have all of the walled oddity in my, my quote unquote, maybe board, which is like my sideboard of cards that I would consider adding to my green, but it's not in there because I just don't think it makes the cut right now. You know? But I do have Pattern of Rebirth in my cube, and I like it a lot. Like, Pattern of Rebirth plus any removal spell is a two-card combo where you just get to get, like, an Ulamog out of your deck. Like, it's it's cool. I don't know. End of your turn. Kill my guy. Search for Emrakul. We'll kill you. Like, I don't know. I think it's, I think it's like, some of these cards require some work and some build around. Same thing with, like, Eureka. And it feels like we're kind of, like, taking those things out for cards that just like do everything. I've angel my Cory. I'll just get the creature immediately or all in Wallady, It's already a creature. It's a four, four. I don't know. Plow under out Nissa ascended animist in plow is another in a long line of green, a long, long green line of what I would call iconic meh. On the other hand, this Nissa is a beast and she's not a beast. She's like an elf incredibly versatile. It also provides another crater hoof effect, which is at the top of the most powerful things green has to offer. Oh, no, this is not the three mana one. This is the seven mana one. I agree with this one being in the cube. This one is super, super good. I think this is a very versatile Nissa. Um, this is also a card that can be played for five mana or it can be played for seven mana. And five, six, or seven mana points are significantly different. Like for five, you get the plus one and make a six, six. For seven, you get to plus one and make an eight, eight. <laughs> like for negative seven, you get to, like, you don't get to do that on the five or six. Like it's got a lot going on. Yeah, it's a, it's a cool card for sure. Oh, no, actually she's not five. She's at three, I guess, if you pay her for five, right? Because each one of these puts two float fewer. So if you paid her for five, she would be, start at three and you make a four, four, which is still very, very good, right? Five mana planeswalker plus one to make a four, four. Yeah, that's a that's a great card. I agree with this a lot. Like it's good on all points. Five, six, seven. Primal Command out. That's totally fine. I think Primal Command is very mediocre. Titania, Protector of Argoth, I also think is fairly mediocre, unfortunately, and I love Titania. Modern Horizons 2 fanatics will know about this legendary elemental generating 10 power. While ramping you with a fetch land is a pretty good deal, but imagine fire blasting your opponents or turning every single land you control into a 5 3 with a Zurin Orb. Wait, what am I missing? What? But imagine fire blasting your opponents or turning every single land you control into a 5 3 with Zurin Orb. This one is certainly sad to see where they're going to go. What, what am I missing? <laughs> Titania? Oh, is this the other Titania? Wait, hold on. I thought this was the 5-3 Titania. It is. Wait. It is the. It is this one. What? Protector of Argoth. Whenever land you control is put into a graveyard, create a 5-3. Oh, I see what they're saying. Imagine fire blasting your opponents. Oh, so they're saying sack two mountains, deal four to their face, and then make two five threes. Okay. I got very confused. For some reason, I thought Titania was whenever, a, when like landfall, whenever it comes into play, you make a five three. And I'm like, wait, what does Zerno have to do? Why are you sacking all your lands? Yeah, I mean, I like Titania a lot. I think she's cool. I don't know how much support. See, I can't look at this list by itself and be like, oh, she has a ton of support in the cube. There's a ton of ways to get lands in your graveyard. I don't know if that's true. I also think Zoranarm is probably pretty narrow if it's still in here. I don't know why it would be, especially because you took out Ravages of War, right? So like you're not leaning into the kill all the land strategy or like maybe balance. I don't know. Seder Wayfinder is out. Probably shouldn't have been in here. Delighted Halfling is in. This is a fine. This is a great change. Seder Wayfinder has some potential to be part of a package to rotate in to support the appearance of a card like Hogak. I'm sorry, what? But it isn't doing enough for enough decks to be a regular. Meanwhile, the half thing is a fantastic alt elf that seems likely to stick around for a while. Yeah, this seems good. Saturday Wayfinder seems like it's kind of trash and Delighted Halfling seems great. Really hoping they didn't put Hogak in the cube for some reason. <laughs> Spring Bloom Druid into Deep Root Wayfinder. I think this is good too. Deep Root Wayfinder seems really cool. 
Spring Bloom Druid was trying to help a couple of archetypes but fell short. One of the goals is to update was to give green. One of the goals of this update was to give green more options in mid range department. And while this one looks rather unassuming, imagine going turn one elf and turn two wayfinder plus strip mine. Again, they're like trying to make strip mine happen, but bribery is not good enough or it's too broken. I don't know. This is <laughs> strip mine is one of the least fun cards in the cube. Like getting mana screwed is one of the least fun experiences you can have. Terastodon out, World Spine Worm in. Old nasty Terasty hasn't been as nasty in recent years. With the downside of the effect mattering more is the creature's increase in importance. So we're adding another big one to Flash or Sneak. Flashing World Spine Worm in, not World Spine Worm in, not terrible. That's interesting. Yeah, all right. I mean, I could see this being fine. Yeah, all right. Sure. Time of need out. Probably shouldn't have been there. Life from the loam in. Don't like that. I feel like now, now I'm getting the impression if they do have Hogak in here that they're replacing sacrifice with dredge, which is really weird because it's a very, very narrow, uh, kind of not super fun archetype to play against. In addition to the support for land shenanigans, Life from the Loam is a nod to Euro, which has been having difficulty getting enough cards in the yard to escape with. It also works well with Beseju and Odawara. Yeah, if you're just using it as like a draw two or draw three with lands that go to the graveyard, I get it. That's fine. Was in the bathroom? Did I miss Boris Reckoner? No, not yet. I, I'm going to give this one any time of need was kind of a stinker. I think Life from the Loam is totally good. Bringing back Tooth and Nail was an experiment last time, but it just wasn't good enough to chase the dream. Disagree completely. This time we're getting another flexible creature that can be hard cast or cheated for good effect. Cheated with what? You're taking out Tooth and Nail. <sighs> Disagree completely. I think Tooth and Nail is a staple, and I think it I think it's just a great card. <laughs> like I think it's a really solid green card. I think it's easy to get to nine mana. It's easier to get to seven mana, which still does something in Tooth and Nail decks. <sighs> I don't know, man. Like. Also, like, okay, so let me look up Titan of Industry. Titan. Enters the battlefield, choose to destroy an artifact or enchantment, create a 4-4. Four, four. And you can't choose the same ones and put a shield counter or... So, I mean, like, yeah, you could play this with Flash and then this will still trigger, but... Again, it's two cards and you get a 3-3 three, three, and you destroy an artifact or enchantment, so you're basically, like, getting... Or 4-4, four, four, rather... So you're base, it's basically like a, a big Rex Sage. <laughs> you waste two cards to get a really big Rex Sage or like a 4-4 four, four that gains five life. Like, it just doesn't... The effect is not exciting enough to flash it in. If you can make two 4-4s, four, I could see that because then it's almost like Crash of Rhinos in a sense. If I could flash this guy in and choose to make two 4-4s, four, like, I would get that. I don't understand this hatred for Tooth and Nail. Like, Toski is out, Asika's Chariot's in. I think this is fine. Uh, Chariot's like a beating on its own, whereas Toski requires other creatures. Chariot almost got in last time and we're leaving. We're not leaving it out this time. It is an absolute house and cube. While Toski was never all that great. A lot of the cards coming in make tokens that Asika would choose over another kitty too. Yeah, I agree. Vorinclex out. I love Vorinclex. Uh, I think he's a super powerful addition. Thrun and Breaker of Silence in. Weak to main, weak to sweepers and green removal. Green removal. Nigh unstoppable. Otherwise, certainly main deckable and will shine. Oh, we're talking about Thrun. I'm like, I didn't know which one we were talking about. Because like, you're not being clear here. Certainly main deckable and will shine out of the board in the right matchups. Yeah, but Vorinclex gets you two lands. Like... When there's a battle push, search driver for two forest cards, reveal and put them in your hand. Like, you can get any forest. Breeding pool, temple garden, tropical island, whatever you want. Also, I flipped this before, and it was unbeatable. Mill ten cards, put two creatures from among the mill cards on the battlefield, to super seven, seven counters, and then you can fight all that. Like, this, if you if you get to flip this dude, it's unbeatable. I have no idea. Like, this is such a, like, such a strong, versatile card, whereas Thrun is like... All right, you can't counter it. 
All right, you can't talk about non-green stuff. All right, it's an destroy. Like it's just a, it's just a big stupid idiot. I don't know. I love Thrun as a character. Don't get me wrong, but this feels like it's got some cool play. It gives you card advantage. Thrun is just like I'm a five-five. You can't deal with like that. Seems less fun to me. Uh, Whisperwood Elemental out. Elder Gargaroth in. I think both of these are fine as five drops in green. My own five drops are Acidic Slime, Deep Forest Hermit, uh, Kura, The Boundless Sky. And I have that because you can get lands with it. You can search your library for up to three lands. So you can literally get like Thespian Stage, Dark Depths, whatever. <laughs> and then I have Thrag Tusk and Vorin Clex. Those are my five drops. Um, but both of these were in at some point. Gargus has a lot of fans who want to see a return and is one of the ads that produces token upgrades for the chariot. It's swapping one fan five mana green turn turnover turn value creature for another yeah i agree with this i think this is fine magic marker studios have a good night buddy worldly tutor out field of the dead in i don't care about worldly tutor and i don't like field of the dead in the cube we leaned away from the lands archetype last time, but it's a reasonable way to give green some archetype depth beyond big creatures quickly. Field of the Dead is mostly a green card and gives a solid boost to Primeval Titan. Interesting. I'm not sure if I agree with that. The green decks for me always want Rafelos, and Rafelos wants forests. So, I mean, if you're picking up a bunch of, like, random temple gardens, and if you're picking up a bunch of forest slash X lands, that's fine. But, like, Field of the Dead is kind of promoting you to have a pretty varied mana base. I don't know. Deathrite Shaman out. Probably great. Assassin's Trophy in. This is fine. I think I think the Assassin... Any, any of the red, black, green removal spells are very, very good. A Constructed Powerhouse that's very hard to profitably set up and limited. Agreed. And wasn't powerful enough as a counter to graveyard strategies. We'll add some universal removal instead. Also one of the few spells that can deal with Dark Depths, Caracas, and Library. I agree with that. I, I think Assassin's Trophy is very, very good. Dreadbore out. Blood Tithe Harvester in. Again, this is fine. I don't know if I still have Dreadbore in my cube. Uh, looks like I don't. This is effectively re reverting a change from the last time. Blood Time is more important to the cube as a glue piece and strong early board presence than this clean, but ultimately medium removal spell sure i don't i don't feel strongly about this one way or another edric out kinnon bonder prodigy in i don't really have a strong attachment to edric but i also don't care about kinnon either edric has certainly been one of the on the weaker side for a while with a very narrow use case kinnon not only works well with your usual mana elves but also goes infinite with basalt monolith So this is whenever you tap a non-land permanent for mana, add one mana of any type that permanent produced. So you can actually tap Basalt Monolith for four, untap it for three, tap it for four, untap it for three, etc. And for seven, you can look at the top five cards of your library. You may put a non-human creature from among them onto the battlefield, put the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. This actually might be better than I'm giving you credit for, but the fact that it's blue-green is a little bit rougher because it's putting you into blue. And that's a lot of the green ramp de decks don't really care about blue it also makes your mana base worse to have to like like a lot of times you can play a late blue card but in order to have like a two drop blue creature like you're i feel like you're gonna have to have blue sources fairly early eladomri's call out voice of resurgence in i think both of these cards are not great the green creature tutors brought in last time underperformed without clear game winning combos to go for so yes because you're taking all of the the, the really strong stuff so the, the importance of getting on board and to offer some further support for Birthing Pod. We've brought... Oh, Birthing Pod is so bad in cube. I hate to say it. It's a great card, but it's bad in cube because it you have to focus so much on your curve while drafting. And sometimes you literally just don't get there. You're like, oh, didn't I pick up a one, only one five drop and I drew it in my opening hand. So now I can't go from four to five to six. Like, it's just really hard to get it to work. We run in voice for the hopeful resurgence. Yeah, it's I don't I don't think that's I don't I don't like it. Goblin Lecture Rants are out, Magma Opus in. That's another testament to taking out like storm-based cards, it looks like. We had some misses last time around, but Dream Halls wasn't one of them, so we're adding some additional support for the archetype with Magma Opus and some ultimatums. 
also Mizzix Mastery, that sounds good for. Uh, the one that lets you keep going, of course, you've also added Mizzix Mastery for another way to cheat these onto the stack. Okay, great. Yeah, I like this a lot. Because you want to do big, stupid, cool stuff in the, in the cube. Hydra Crass is out. Sail into the west. I don't even think I know what that is. What is this? 24 cent card. Great. Fantastic. Starting with you. Okay, so as soon as something says Will of the Council, I get a little suspicious because you're, it's obviously meant for multiple players, not just two. I never had Decimator's Web in my cube, no. Uh, starting with you, each player votes for Return or Embark. If Return gets more votes, each player returns up to two cards from their graveyard to their hand, then you exile Sail into the West. If Embark gets more votes, so the vote is tied, each player may discard their hand and draw seven cards. Yeah, it is. It's a, it's a Middle-Earth Commander card. but So... The thing is, Embark is almost always going to hit, right? You're always going to want to... It's a draw seven, right? It's just a four mana draw seven in blue and green. Okay, let's see what it says. Always solid, but never great. That's a reasonable description of everyone's favorite jellyfish. Instead of getting another draw seven for four in an instant... It is an instant. That's interesting. Each player may discard their hand and draw seven. It's also a May ability, too. You don't have to. That's interesting. I don't know how I feel about this. On the one hand, it, it, it does go nicely from, like, Leovold, which is also blue-green, or Narset, into Sail into the West. Yeah, like, it works really well with those. So, I don't know. It could be good. Again, that's really super oppressive and that doesn't feel any better than bribery. Like, so I don't know if that's your goal. Oh, oh man, I love Coma Cosmo Serpent. I don't care about Tamiyo, Collector of Tales. Green doesn't need another big threat and Coma can be frustrating to play with and against depending on who has what removal suite. That's the point though. It's a big fat idiot. <laughs> that's like saying Ulamog, Ceaseless Hunger can be, can be difficult to play against because it has indestructible. Yeah. But you, you paid blue, blue, green, green, three. Euro has been suffering because it's been hard to fill the yard. Tamio shall be the Titan's new partner in crime while also being very solid on her own. I think Tamio is fine, but I think the justification for, for, for taking out like a card like Coma, which is seven mana and double blue and double green is rough. Dead message, dead message. Thank you for saying so, man. I really appreciate it. Yeah, I love, I love cubes, and I hope yours is wonderful. Oh, lightning helix out for fourth Eorlingus. I like this a lot, and I was really hoping they added this. Another icon that stopped being a high pick a long time ago. Fourth Eorlingus come comes in already on a no fun watch list. But how could we not give this a try? Splashable, aggressive cards are perfect for red white. This one might be too perfect. We'll see. Uh, I think this card's fantastic. Um, yeah, this is, this is a great card. I'm really glad they added it. Um, I'm looking forward to playing with this. Hopefully tomorrow <laughs> at some point we can hit, we can open it. Maelstrom pulls out Terra Sunder in. I do have Terra Sunder in my queue because I think its versatility is really, really strong. You can play it as a mono green naturalize. Um, I'm just looking at it. I'm finding it on my list right now so I can, so I can see it. Yeah, here we go. Yeah, so exile target artifact or enchantment. If this spell was kicked, you exile a non-land permanent instead. So it's literally just a two-mana naturalize that exiles the artifact or enchantment instead. And if you kick it with black and one, then you just get literally a four-mana Maelstrom Pulse. So it's just it's just way more versatile. It costs one more to get the Maelstrom Pulse effect, but it's an instant instead of a sorcery. And you can play it in one color if you want. Pulse is a classic that certainly does something, but Terra Sunder does it better on average, exiling just about anything at instant speed, even Cauldre Complete. Yeah, it gets rid of indestructible things. So you can literally get rid of an Ulamog with it if you wanted to, because it doesn't care about indestructible. Mayhem Devil out. Fire Covenant in. Mayhem Devil, that's fine. Take that dude out because they're not sacrificing. What is Fire Covenant? Is it the one with the dragon on the front? Five. Oh, that's, I was like, wait, did I spell that wrong? No, it's, so we're going to go fire, not five. 
Yep. All right. That's what I thought. Deals X damage. Pay X life. Deals X damage divided as you choose among any number of target creatures. This is just basically channel fireball that can only deal damage to creatures, right? Like, but it's in one card. The King of Sacrifices leaves together with his squad and might return with some of the better sacrifice parts in the future iteration. The life payment on Fire Covenant is no joke, but neither a three mana plague neither is a three mana plague wind. If Toxic Deluge is a vintage cube staple, Fire Rent Covenant has a case to make as well. But are they both in here? That's the question. Speaking of this, I have no real opinion here. I don't know if Fire Covenant's gonna be great. It could be fine. It's kind of fun. It's an instant, which is really strong. Um, yeah, could be cool. Fire Covenant plus Boros Reckoner. Wow. Marari's Wake out. I, that doesn't, that doesn't really bother me as much as you'd think it would. Like Marari's Wake is a card that seems like it's an archetype, but it's so rare that people actually built around or played Marari's Wake. It just, it was probably one out of like 50 games. I would see a Marari's Wake, you know, maybe, maybe less than that. I don't know. Sigard is really, really good, though. Mirari's Wake can join Heartbeat and Palancron in their retirement home until they can be part of a package that makes sense to bring in. Let's try this powerful mid-range legend in the Selesnia shot. Slot. I'm doing very well tonight. Very well. Uh, Sigard is really, really strong. Other permanents you control have Hexproof. You may look at the top card of your library at any time, and then you can cast Angel and Humans from the top of your library. I have this in my Innistrad cube because there's a big angel and human theme. That being the case, I really don't know how strong this is going to be because this is the, you may cast angel and human spells is one of the biggest parts of the card. Otherwise it's just a four, four flyer for five that gives you other permanent text proof, which is good, but you really want to be able to utilize this. And I don't know how many humans and angels are in the cube. So Either way, still fine. It's a great four drop. Nahiri the Harbinger out. That's interesting. Othari, Sun's Glory in. Othari is also in my cube because I think this card is fantastic. But I also like Nahiri because, again, she's a creature cheater. She cheats big creatures into play. Nahiri was a powerhouse when the form was much slower and more defined by Signets. The other one looks like a dragon, plays like a dragon, and is actually a phoenix. Yeah, for those who don't know... This was in one of the commander decks. So it's flying lifelink haste three, three for five. Okay. When it enters, when it attacks, you get an experience counter, then create a two, two red rebel that's tapped and attacking for each experience counter you have. So attack once, make a one, one, make, make one, two, two, make two, two, twos, make three, two, twos for four mana. You can tap an untapped rebel you control and return this from your graveyard to the battlefield tapped. It's just a super versatile flying creature that like hits all the metrics. Like it makes other creatures. It makes multiple other creatures. It has a real assemble the Legion feel to it. And uh, it can keep coming back because it's a Phoenix. So Nicol Bolas, God Pharaoh is out. Cruel Ultimatum is in. I don't like them taking out Nicol Bolas, God Pharaoh. I think it's a good card. I like it a lot. But they took out Arena Rector, so I understand what they're doing. Cruel Ultimatum. Love it. With Arena Rector out and Dream Hall's winning hearts and games, we switch Grixis seven drops. Yep, I, I get it. Why not both? I don't know. I, I think you only want, like... Like, for me, my Grixis cards are Nicol Bolas the Ravager at four, Nicol Bolas Dragon God at five, and Nicol Bolas Planeswalker at eight. I don't actually have Godfair or Cruel Ultimatum because I think you have to kind of build around Cruel Ultimatum. You can't just hope someone gets a um, a Grixis deck that supports it. Um, whereas like, you know, the other Planeswalkers go well with Arena Rector or there's other, maybe there's other cards you can put them into play with. Um, but yeah, I, I think you want cards. Like, I don't think you add cards like Cruel Ultimatum or Inspired Ultimatum unless you can have other ways to cast them because otherwise people are going to be like, well, there are no Grixis drafters at this table, so I just don't get to play these cards. Niv-Mizzet Reborn out, Inspired Ultimatum in. I don't know if I agree with this. I think Niv-Mizzet Reborn is a cool thing to build around. Niv-Mizzet has big fans, but we'll bring them back when the basic plan of digging for two color gold is more supported. This ultimatum is an inspired way to keep your dream halls turn alive. I feel like they're really emphasizing dream halls 
in this article. And the one person who gets dream halls in their draft is going to be well suited. They're going to, they're going to have everything they want. Uh, being said, the people who don't get it, you just got a bunch of cards that you can't cast. Yeah. All right. Well, I mean, they know only one player can get it, right? Spell Queller out, Urza Lord Protector in. Was Urza... Urza Lord Protector is the blue-white one. That's interesting. Oh, wait. Now I'm excited because I think they also have the, the Stone of Might and Weakness or whatever. The Might Stone and Weak Stone or whatever. Spell Queller is great and will certainly return in the future, but we wanted to add the Might Stone and Weak Stone. Okay, I guess you just got to agree. There it is. And it feels like a lie to add one of a meld pair to a cube. I agree with that. Yeah, I agree completely. I think you always want to have the potential to meld the creatures because it just feels really cool. Uh, Urza Lord Protector is hardly a vintage cube slouch with cost reductions. Some decks are absolutely looking for. Hopefully this will help Paradoxical Outcome get there while fulfilling the promise represented by the Might Stone and Weeks. Are you, you got Paradoxical Outcome? Uh, Tezzeret Agent of Bullets out. Urtai resurrected in. This is fine. I think Tezzeret Agent of Bullets is a little too narrow. And I, I'm assuming that you already have Tezzeret the Seeker, which is a great blue card that does very similar thing. I think you only really want one artifact based Planeswalker. Uh, Tez just made a reappearance and we are sending him away again, but we want to try Urtai with the lean into punishing opponent draws in blue and black and shield with Shieldred, Fairy Mastermind, and Orcish Bowmasters. Although not Hullbreacher at this time. <laughs> okay, that's fine. Hullbreacher is super oppressive. Urtai would serve a solid role in almost any iteration of the Vintage Cube, but this feels like the time to put him in. It's fine. I think Urtai is great. It's in my cube as well. Valky out. No, don't like that. Croxa in. Eh, it's fine. Switching from one early discard late game powerhouse to another, we could have left this alone given alone given all the change but croc says fans will be happy to see him back yeah but valky has fans as well tybalt has fans as well and the flexibility to change things up this way without harm is one of the great strengths of cube i don't know i don't agree with this i think valky with like bring to light and just casting him like valky's such a cool planeswalker I don't know. Croxa is fine, but like the number of times people have actually escaped a Croxa is so low. Like, it's not like, it doesn't feel like Euro where like you have a bunch of, it feels like Euro is a lot easier to, to get out of your graveyard than Croxa is. And I don't know. It, it feels like Valky's just a cooler card. Wear tear out Zerda the Dawn Waker in. So let's look at Zerda because I don't know the exact wording on it. It's activated abilities, right? Each permanent card in your starting deck has an activated ability. Uh, activated abilities that aren't mana abilities cost two less. It can't reduce the mana less than one, and target creature can't block this turn. What's Euro? Euro, whatever, however you want to say it. Look what I look what I did. Let's put a comma here. That'll solve the problem. It didn't solve the problem. Euro. Titan. There you go. This guy. Wear Tear was a fine stopgap while we looked for something more fun to do with the slot. On a further quest to give artifacts more combo potential and bore us some archetype depth, we'll add Zerda to allow for infinite mana with the monoliths. I do like that because the untap ability is not a mana ability, so you actually get to untap it for like one. But like, what are you going to do with all this mana? Like, what are you doing with the infinite mana? I don't actually know. Xenagos out, Dragonlord to target back in. I think that's fine. I think Xenagos, God of Revels, is kind of meh. But Dragonlord to is really good. Xenagos was an experiment with the addition of Tooth and Nail last iteration. Oh, is, is Xenagos is the five mana one? Yes, it is. I don't, yeah, that's that card's kind of meh. Like, it's frustrating because that's a card that's like only good with tooth and nail when you can get two specific creatures, one of which is Xenagos and like, you're never going to want to like cast it on its own. So like, that's, that's just like too narrow. And I kind of try to avoid cards like that, that are just narrow like that, that only fit into one specific thing. Uh, but now we're both leaving. Our target gets the job done, whether it be from the graveyard through the breach or hard cast. I, I agree. I like, I like an Atarka. 
all 10 signets are out. All 10 talismans are in. I agree with this. I have myself moved from signets to talismans. It's because I think talismans have just, or signets have just screwed me too much where I'm like, I want to play a specific thing and keep like a blue and X up. And I can't do that because my signet's like red, red, white or something. And so I have to keep a signet and a land, a blue land up, but I have to use the blue land to activate the signet where if that was any talisman, I could have the blue mana and the talisman mana. It's just, there's too many situations where like, it just doesn't work out and it can be frustrating because I'm like, I have the mana. It's just, there's no way to, to sequence this where it works. Talismans are not strictly better than signets from a rule standpoint, but talismans are generally better. Plus they are strictly better from an interface standpoint. Yeah, that's true too. And vi if vintage cube is running two mana color pair rocks, let's make the experimental upgrade. Exper experiential upgrade, not experimental. Sorry. Coercive portal out Palantir of Orthanc in. I think this is fine. It's one less and they both have very similar effects. You're always going to get to scry with, with Palantir and you're going to be drawing cards pretty frequently or else your opponent's going to just kill themselves. Um, yeah, this seems good. Inkwa Leviathan out, Triplicate Titan in. Stinky Inky has lived up to its nickname for not being all that untouchable. Triplicate Titan is another piece to go with Flash that fits a lot of other strategies nicely as well. Recurring Nightmare, Sneak Attack, Goblin Welder, etc. We'll all have some fun moving this Titan through the zones. Let's look at that guy. So it's a 9-9 nine, nine for 9. When it dies, you make three three threes. Yeah, okay. I think that's fine. I don't know. It's not super exciting, but it's it's reasonable. Karn Liberated is out. <sighs> don't like that. And you're replacing it with a nine mana portal of Phyrexia. The difference between seven mana and nine mana is humongous. Karn used to be an early pick, but these days often doesn't give enough a return on the seven mana investment. I don't know if that's true. We feel Portal of Phyrexia will prove to be one of the best tinker targets in the cube and a future mainstay. I love Portal of Phyrexia. I think it's a super cool card. I do not mind including it, but at the cost of Karn is really painful to me. Lodestone out. Love it. Mystic Forge in. Mm, okay. Lodestone has a tough time finding a deck that doesn't have to give up too much to play it. I agree with that. Or has the artifact dense to be good. Mystic Forge certainly isn't easy, but the upside is huge and it fits nicely with some of the changes made last time. And this time around, it combos with top. Why do you have top in the cube? It's terrible. It's a terrible play experience. Uh, to create wins with Aetherflux Reservoir and gives the artifact deck another way to generate card advantage. Yeah, I don't know. I, I think Mystic Forge is a fine card to try, but it also scares me because it is a very, very strong card and it does take a lot to build around. Lotus Bloom out, Mox Opal in. So we're swapping it for a different zero mana alpha throwback artifact, but these are not the same. Like Lotus Bloom is meant for the storm decks. Mox Opal is meant for the artifact deck. So I don't know. You're not, they're not synonymous. Like these aren't just filling different role. They're not, they're not just filling the same role in the different, in the same decks. I, I, I don't really care. I, I didn't think Lotus Bloom is great. I worry about Mox Opal because it was banned. Uh, Metal Worker is out. Crystalline Giant is in. That's interesting. In 2014, I once Metal Worker for 10 on turn two. I think that's the last time anyone did anything with it. That's, that's so incorrect. That's so not real. We wanted to put Urza's Bobble in this slot. <laughs> You're taking a Metal Worker for Urza's Bobble. Uh, to go with Sahili Luris and Underworld Breach, but it's not a card we currently have access to using cubes. The Giant was a late swap as a fun artifact creature that plays well digitally. It will probably become something else next time but it can be a curve filler for any deck that wants to cast an attack with. What? No, just leave metal. Metal worker is, is infinitely better to have than this. The turns where you play a metal worker and they just don't have it is unreal to me. Like those are so, so, so rewarding. Oblivion stone out. Great. No one ever played oblivion stone. Even like no one ever cast it. No one ever put it in their decks. The one ring is an incredibly powerful card, but considering you can't just reset it with, with another one of the cube, one does have to be mindful of the increasing loss of life and the lookout for sacrifice effects. I agree. I think the one ring is much more tame in limited formats because you can't just 
sacrifice it. You can't just play a new one and have it reset. So yeah, this is a great, great swap. Sword of Feast and Famine into Andoral. I think Andoral Flame of the West is phenomenal. I think it's really, really strong. Swords have been underfirming as a whole, and specific color hate is also rather problematic. Endural is just better in a vacuum with an on attack trigger rather than a combat damage trigger and making its own flying to equips. I, I agree. I love Sword of Feast and Famine. I think it's really strong. I think it's one of the best. I think it's one of the top three or four swords you can put in the cube. Um, that being said, I have no real attachment to it, and I think getting an Endoral with uh, Stoneforge Mystic is going to be really, really strong. Timeless Lotus out, which is sad. I have Timeless Lotus in my cube because I have a five color theme. So this just lets you cast all the five color cards in the deck if you want. For the Meeks, Meeks the Might Stone and Weak Stone, Mono Brown often struggles with drawing enough cards in a deck with so many slots committed to Mana Rocks, payoffs, and interactions. The modality on the Might Stone and Weak Stone comes in clutch here, and who doesn't immediately put melding this thing on their bucket list? I agree with that. I think the Might Stone and Weak Stone is very strong. I also think, what does it draw you two cards, right? Yeah, draw two cards. I mean, this is a good replacement for Muldrifter almost. Like, I mean, it's not a straight replacement, but it's a five mana card that draws you two cards that puts something on the board that does a cool thing. Yeah, I mean, this is a, this is a strong card. And I do want to meld Urza for sure. I will definitely be looking for both of them. So Winter Orb out, Pentad Prism in. I don't care about Pentad Prism, but I do think taking Winter Orb out is totally fine. It's an unfun card. It's, it's worse than like a bribery, so I can't fault them for that. I think it's like a smokestack type card where you just don't want to see it because not because it's too strong, but because it's just not fun. While Orb has fans and is still cute with cards like Urza, it's not the card it once was. Prism is a great card for any combo deck. Gets you right up to Dream Hall's mana and gives you another boost to Parallax Paradoxical Outcome. We will look at bringing Winter Orb back in a Denial Rocks package in the future. Okay. Worn Power Stone is out. This is kind of surprising to me. I love Worn Power Stone. I, I don't think it's the most powerful card in the cube, but I mean, it's just on turn three, just playing it and ramping to six is really, really cool. Foundry Inspector does not have the same. It ramps you to five instead because your artifacts cost one less and it only gives you artifacts. So I I don't agree with this. Worn Power Stone, much like Metalworker, is a hard one to make a good case for outside of Mishra's Workshop. I disagree. You can just play it on three and just... Uh, Boundary Inspector is another nod to our combo artifacts theme with Top, Forge, and Paradoxical Outcome. Sure. I see what they're doing. I just don't think these... The way they explain these really, really clutch staple cards, are just, it's it's just very strange to me. Oh, Carpalusan Forest is out for Raging Ravine. I don't think you should have ever swapped this in. Rashad and Port for Mana Confluence. That's fine. I think this is a great swap. I think Rashad and Port kind of sucks. Um, I think it's the same thing with like strip mine and wasteland where it's like, I want to play my cards, <laughs> you know, mana denial in general isn't great in the modern era, but tapping two lands to tap one land is even worse. Fixing. Meanwhile, fixing your mana never gets old. Sulfur Springs for Raven Cairns. We'll try this over the Springs, but we aren't bringing back the creature land here. Croxa likes this swap. Sure. It's, uh. I think Lava Claw Reaches is fine. I don't think it's... I think I've won numerous games with Lava Claw Reaches. And it kills, like, a 4-4 that they have to... Like, if they, if I have, like, 6 untapped mana and I attack with a Lava Claw Reaches for 7 man, seven damage, they just have to block it. Like, I don't know. Underground River into Creeping Tarpit. Again, probably the perfect change. Like, this just these just should have been in there. Creeping Tarpit was more important to Demir than cutting it last time. G gave it credit for... ETB tap to dual lands have a severe drawback in this environment, but this Raging Green and Celestial Colonnade are worth it for their archetypes. I agree. And that's it. Those are the 80 changes. That was a lot of changes. This almost <laughs> took about two hours to go over all of them, but I think it was important. And now I have a better idea of what we'll be drafting tomorrow or today or this week, depending on when you watch this video. Let me know what you guys think. There was a lot of changes here. I would love to see your thoughts in the comments below. If you're watching on YouTube, definitely check out HelloFresh. You get 50% off the first box and free delivery, and you can cancel at any time. And it's a great way to help out the channel. Really would appreciate that. Hope you guys, uh, hope you guys have some thoughts on this cube. I'm really, I'm really not sure what to expect. I think they took out some of my favorite cards. They put in some new unique cards that I do like. And um, yeah, looking, looking forward to seeing what you guys think. And uh, thanks for watching, guys. I'll see you next time.